There you go. I'm having a chat with uh, clarinetist Michael Webster, flutist Leon Bicey. Did I get it? Uh, and, yeah. And we're going to uh, we're, we're speaking about the Webster Trio, and of, and of course we are going to uh, discuss uh, the missing member of the trio, pianist Robert Mooling, who died in 2018. And uh, this is kind of a, in a way, a tribute to him. And what what a tribute, by the way, making a CD. How lucky. Uh, this this is uh, this is help um, uh, a Crystal Records release from 2015. It's called American Webster, and it's American chamber music for clarinet, flute, and piano, and, and a wonderful assemblage of composers that I want to ask you about. Our American composers, Libby Larson, uh, Robert Sirota, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Richard yes. Tunzing, I didn't didn't fix it earlier, Tunzing. Tenzing. 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 <laughs> Richard Tenzing, I, was, I fixed it there one place, didn't fix it there. <laughs> excuse me, and, and Paul Schoenfeld. <laughs> and these are, excuse me for my cold here, but these are really, uh, uh, you know, I use the word masterpiece probably too much. These are, I'd rather use in this sense, these are solid. These are really solid well, pieces. We agree. In the, in the repertoire. So we're going to discuss these pieces. We're going to have a little look look uh, at uh, Robert Mooling and how you guys met. But uh, there's something far more important. I hope I'm not going to get myself in trouble. The first thing I've got to know is your romance and marriage. Can you tell me the story? A story that could take a whole hour. But the, the, the funniest thing about our romance and marriage is, number one, we don't remember when we met each other. I was a junior at the Eastman School of Music when Leon was a freshman. And at that time, I was engaged to be married to another flutist. Her name was Nancy Howe. And we were married in <clears throat> 1965. And Leon was a guest at that wedding. Because we, we were all in my hometown of Ithaca, New York, where yes. Nancy, yes, Nancy's father was teaching horn at Ithaca College. And so fast forward, Nancy and I had three sons. Uh, our marriage lasted 13 years, and then Leon uh, left the Rochester Philharmonic, where we, we were uh, colleagues for five years, was it? Seven. Seven years, and then she went out to San Francisco, and I got a one-year position playing principal clarinet in San Francisco, and that's where our romance began, and we found our hearts in San Francisco. Wonderful, and uh, did you, uh, did you with intention go for that job? I mean, did you know that you knew she was in... Uh, San Francisco. I knew she was there, but it was a job, and uh, I wanted the job. Good news was that I got the job for that one. Now, that, that if we could just go back just a little bit, I lost you for a bit. I'm afraid I haven't quite solved this sound problem. I think you were drowned out by an 18-wheeler. Go back just a little bit, please. You were speaking, you, you gotten the job in San Francisco. Yes. The good news is that I won the principal clarinet job on a one-year basis. And the bad news is that I didn't win it permanently the, the following year. So I went back to Rochester, where, where I was in the Rochester Philharmonic. And not long after that, Leon won her job in Boston. And all that time, we were doing a long-distance relationship thing. That works. And eventually, uh, I was able to get work in Boston. I got a teaching job at uh, Boston University, which is where I met Robert Sirota for the first time. He was in the administration there. And then uh, eventually I got a teaching job at NEC while Leon was still in the Boston Symphony. And at NEC I taught clarinet, but I also started conducting. I conducted one of the wind ensembles there, and that moved me toward orchestral conducting. And now I've been the happy uh, artistic director of the Houston Youth Symphony for 21 and a half years. This is wonderful. By the way, you took took the fire right out of my intro uh, for, for you. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. But uh, this is wonderful because tenure as a conductor, you know, remember we, when, when I was a kid, it was like, oh, I'm going to get a job in some lovely little town in the Midwest and be conducted there for 87 years until I drop dead on the podium. It doesn't happen anymore as orchestras become, what, more marketing conscious. But yeah. so may I just congratulate you on having a wonderful, solid job with a great youth orchestra. Well, I've found a good fit with the youth orchestra. Yeah. And these uh, high school uh, players, you know, teenagers from age 13 to 18, play so incredibly well. Houston is a huge city with a metropolitan area of 4 million population. 
So it's a large talent pool. And I'm very proud to say that we performed Don Juan of Richard Strauss last year, known to be one of the toughest orchestral pieces, and they played it really well. And I'm happy to share the YouTube with all of your listeners. <laughs> and, I, and I have fond memories of the Seattle Youth Symphony, and for 12 years I conducted Seattle Wind Ensemble. Same thing, a huge pool, high schools. I think there were 60 high schools in Greater Seattle. I know exactly what you mean. Beautiful, wonderful players that I'm sure you know, I know to this day. Uh, many principals in, in, in other orchestras and so on. It's, it's so rewarding. And by the way, music ain't dead, folks. These youth orchestras are still going strong. Everything, everything's just fine. Don't pay any attention to all the rumors. Uh, that's how. That's what I say. Let's go ahead and move on. Let me first. Let's finish the intros for heaven's sake. Clarinetist Michael Webster, as you uh, know, is also conductor of the Houston Youth Symphony, but is professor of music at, uh, and clarinet at Rice University Shepherd School of Music. Uh, flutist Leon. Bicey, I hope I got it because I'm not. Yeah. At, I'm not at the respell yet. Uh, uh, Joseph and Ida K. Mullen, professor of flute at Rice University Shepherd School of Music. How do you pull that off? I know so many married couples. I guess it's a. It must be a bargain. You know, two for one sale when they hire you. Uh, wonderful. Uh, and former principal, as is so obvious on this CD that we're going to speak of, former principal flute of the uh, Boston Symphony. Or, uh, Give me, give me the detail on that so I don't get out of line there. Am I close? First of all, assistant principal, and then for my last three years in Boston, acting principal, but meanwhile had been principal of the Boston Pops for seven years with John Williams during the first seven years of my tenure there. Thank you for uh, clarifying because, you know, it's I, I, I figured I might misspeak, misspeak, so it's better just to get it, get it uh, cleared up, everybody in their proper positions. Uh, pianist Robert Mulling, um, again, died in January, I think, 2018, you said? That's correct. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, uh, pursued uh, grad studies at the uh, Indiana University uh, after graduating Rotterdam Conservatory, Fulbright Hayes Grant. Uh, I have a feeling, now, I, of course, I didn't know the men, but there's just something about, because uh, I, of course, had to look around a little bit. Uh, I'd, I'd kind of like to know, if, if I'm not pressing, pressing too hard, can you give me an idea of, of Robert Mulling's um, type as a human being, his character, his aesthetic, his, you know what I mean, the kind of kind of person that he was? Can you do that? Well, the thing that he was was a Renaissance man. He, he knew music repertoire, not just piano repertoire, but the symphonic repertoire, the chamber music repertoire. You could rarely mention a piece of music that he didn't know, whether he had played it or not. And, and uh, he played in a garage band in his neighborhood. You know what? That's the way things go these days. I love it. I used to hate it as a as a snobby young conductor. You know, I I just I yeah. had nothing. But this is this melting. I'm sure you see it even at Rice. This melting of all these wonderful man's manners of music. And of course, he didn't do that long, right? Well, and in, in addition to that, uh, Robert was an avid gardener, a fabulous cook. He installed the speakers in our stereo system in this room that we're, that we're sitting in. He was a there, woodworker. There are so many uh, evidences of, of Robert's impact on our life uh, that it's hard to imagine. Uh, we're speaking with you on January 8th of 2019, and in two days it will be the anniversary of Robert's death. So he's on our minds constantly at this particular time. Wonderful and, and perfect, really. I'm, somehow the timing worked beautifully. Uh, let me see what else he was in. He was also involved with, with the preparatory program at Rice University. Is that correct? Yes, yes, he was. He was a dedicated teacher. And after his death, the outpouring from his students, who ranged, I would say, from what? Um, oh, probably six eight or seven or, six or eight or seven, years old. Yeah, yeah. Little kids. Two uh, juniors, seniors in high school. He he had such an impact on their lives as not only a piano teacher, but as as a human being, a, a real mentor, and I think they felt very close to him. Some some kids wrote poems, some painted, some some just wrote. It was it was very very moving. One of, his, one of his students uh, did an oil painting of him, a portrait. This was a teenager, and when I first saw it uh, on Patty's, Patty is the name of his wife. Uh, on her wall, you know, at, a, at a, about 20 or 24 feet away, I thought it was a photograph. 
And then as I got close to it, I realized, no, it wasn't a photograph, it was a painting. And as I got even closer, I thought, oh my goodness, this painting by this teenager captured Robert's personality just to a T. And Pat, what did Patty say? She said, it shows the, the two sides of Robert, the, the affable side and the, and the do it my way side. You know, that's really very nice. There is a certain need to be disciplined to, uh, with kids, yes. to, to instill discipline, but also Absolutely. be a nice human being and, and treat people properly. When did you, when, when did you two meet Robert, and how, what was the gestation to end up in 1988 as the Webster Trio? Well, we met Robert at the Park City Festival in Utah and shared a condo with him, and it's funny, the first time that we were, were to play with Robert, Leon got ill. This was in the mid-90s, because 1988, we were in Boston and formed the Webster Trio with Martin Amlin, a very close friend and professor of composition and theory at Boston University. He's written numerous works for us. But after that, we had Catherine Collier at the University of Michigan as our second Webster Trio pianist. And then in the mid-90s, having met Robert, we realized there was a connection. But how, did, how did you meet him musically? That's what I'm kind well, of getting that's the strange story. Leon was ill. We were due to do one of my many transcriptions for flute, clarinet, and piano. I think it was 4A, maybe, 4A Dolly Suite. And that would have been 1996, I believe. Yeah. And Leon got sick, so Robert and I had to fill the program with something, and we chose the Debussy Premier Rhapsody, which I had played numerous times with my father. For your listeners, uh, my father was Beveridge Webster. He studied in Paris from 1921 to the 1930s and taught, a, and taught, a Juilliard, taught a Juilliard for 40-some years. And he knew the French repertoire intimately, so I, in essence, learned the Debussy Rhapsody from my dad. And I played it with Robert, and it was one of those occasions, Dan, where our musical ideas just clicked. It was, uh, we didn't really talk much, we didn't rehearse much, we played it, we liked it, and, and we performed it. And there was that musical connection that was right there from the beginning. And that's the magic. Yeah. You know, it happens or it doesn't. Yeah. Very often it doesn't. <laughs> so. Huh, that's very interesting. And, and how, what was his approach? How, how did you guys approach this CD in terms of making the decisions of the re about the repertoire? Did, was it delegated? How, how'd, you, how'd you do that? Well, we had already made the first Webster Trio CD with Robert uh, in, well, how many years before? It was the worldwide Webster. Michael's transcriptions for flute, clarinet, and piano uh, we had recorded with Catherine Collier on Tour de France, and then with Robert, the uh, worldwide Webster, Brahms, Debussy, Dvorak, and uh, who's uh, 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 Louis Moreau Gottschalk. And Bizet also. Oh, no, that was on Tour de France. Let's tour. see, big, 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 maybe bigger. <laughs> and I mean, even, by the way, the Gottschalk, uh, right away my ears perked up. There's, there's a very interesting uh, composer. Very well, interesting. Oh, yes. Gotcha. Let's do that. Let's start that one over again. Yeah, I lost you because of uh, some motorcyclist. Go ahead. Gottschalk. Gottschalk wrote uh, a lot of music, and I would say a small percentage of it is really excellent. Uh, but to put him in his right place, he wrote, for example, a gorgeous mazurka for piano alone. It's one of the few things that the Webster Trio recorded that wasn't an originally piano four hands, but for piano alone. And to compare him with Chopin, you would think that this mazurka was written by Chopin. It's, it, the style is so similar. But the difference between Gottschalk and Chopin is that Gottschalk wrote one extraordinary mazurka, and Chopin wrote 50 extraordinary mazurkas. <laughs> 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 to get back to your question, Michael and I founded the Flute Clarinet Duos Consortium in the year 2000, and Libby Larson was our first commission, hence the barn dances inclusion on our American Webster. And some of the other connections, the one with Robert Sirota, simply we had known him from Boston, and he is a very close friend of colleagues at, on the Shepherd School faculty, Norman and Jean Fisher. 
a husband and wife duo, cello and piano, and we heard Jean play a piece that, that Bob had written for her, and we loved it, and we asked him if he would be willing to write us something for our 20th wedding anniversary and the 20th anniversary of the Webster Trio. So he said yes, that was really wonderful. Richard Tensing, the late Richard Tensing, was a faculty member at the University of Colorado Boulder, and I had met him in Boston when I played his concerto for flute, piccolo, and alto, I think, uh, for wind ensemble, yes, for wind ensemble with my high school band director, Frank Battisti, who was the director of wind ensembles at, at uh, the New England Conservatory. Tony Brandt, Anthony Brandt, is our faculty colleague. He wrote a piece for us. Richard Tensing wrote the Children of Light for us. And Paul Schoenfeld is the one person that we really never knew personally. We haven't met him, but there is a, a sort of a family connection because he wrote the piece for the Hunter family in Minneapolis. And uh, the son, John Hunter, actually studied clarinet with me for one semester when Stanley Hasty was on sabbatical from the Eastman School of Music. So I've known John since he was a you know, 22-year-old at Eastman. Small world, small world. Yeah. Yes. And, and by the way, uh, clearly you're very experienced in interviews because you have just, you have just uh, aid, immediately segued where I was getting ready to go. But now let's go back. Okay, and to do a little more detail, okay? Uh, because, uh, well, I, I told you before we tape, Libby Larson, I'm in love. I love everything by Libby Larson. I think she's fabulous. And for you to tell me, as you just did, I think, you commissioned barn dances? The Flute Clarinet Duos Consortium consists of I see. duos around the country who contribute to... Cons uh, to commissions, and so we had what, what about twelve different duos involved in that, and then regional premieres are given by each of the of the duos. Because barn dances is probably an, uh, an iconic part of, of her repertoire. Barn dances is performed all the time. I think it's pretty. I popular. think it's, it's a great piece. Well, it's one, one of the things that we're I say proudest of is that after forming the Webster Trio and. Uh, contributing to the repertoire through my transcriptions and some of these commissions, uh, flute, clarinet, and piano trios have popped up all over the place, like uh, dandelions, you know. They're, they're all over, and they're playing a repertoire that didn't exist before. Wonderful. And that is the purpose. I, I think what I've discovered, I've discovered repertoire right, left, and center, reviewing all these incredible CDs that are, you know, a stack I can see it here about two feet tall now but the, but the point is there's so much magical fabulous uh, repertoire and I hope my part of my duty will be to make sure that because there are as we know lots of uh, professional musicians that are watching this I'm not flattering myself I'm just saying that's that's the audience and, and college music faculty this I hope is my duty to say hey pianists pay attention here's this one or uh, trio here yeah Right, so let's let's. I, what I'd like to do is just start kind of at the beginning, at the top of the album. We let's kind of brush on it. Where, how we got? We, we're we're okay. Um, but let me just read the the uh, uh, titles of Libby Larson's barn dances of the pieces, because people I think will instantly get an idea of what a playful piece this is. In my view, forward six, fall back eight. That's number one. Delightful, rhythmic, you know, charming. Second piece, divide the ring. Bits of boogie woogie, honky tonk, all that good stuff. Uh, between the three movements, lots of narrative and conversation. I'm just get, giving you my kind of my notes on this. Um, uh, Varzuviana, what is that? We had to look that one up. It's a very <laughs> slow waltz. Ah, very. You know what I was hearing? Great Plains. That slow waltz. Something. It's very yeah. American. It's, Mm -hmm. that, that vast great plains kind of sound that's that now there's one you try to explain to to somebody oh well the sound is like the great plains and they look at you like you're out of your mind sprawling and leisurely uh rattlesnake twist by the way that had a, that movement has a lot of wonderful stuff for clarinet special effects and colors well, and the rattlesnake twist has this motor rhythm and we particularly love the way it ends because it ends with the flute and clarinet playing loud short chords 
opposite the clarinet, it sounds like we're trying to play together, but not playing together. It goes, to cheat, to cheat, to cheat, to cheat, and then the last chord we finally do play together. I don't know of any other piece that ends that way. It's really fun. You know, I want to use the word cute without sounding obnoxious, uh, but, but uh, what a wonderful sense of, uh, of humor Libby has in this piece. I love her imagery, not only here, the way she can really make you believe <laughs> the titles and, and see, well, the square dancing or whatever, uh, the barn dancing, if you will, but her, her imagery in her other work. I mean, her to me, she is an imagist. Uh, Absolutely. Really. Robert Sirota, Birds of Paradise, Paradise, 2008. I've tracked that one, that uh, composition date down. You know, now here's here's one where I want to shout out uh, people. Uh, please pay attention and go out and buy this piece and learn it and add it to your repertoire. I mean, the, the it, it's so evocative. The flute motif opens. I mean, the clarinet. All we are in a, a tropical jungle. How is that to put together? By the way, the sound engineering is superb. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, the Sirota is bird song, and some people have said, "Oh, it reminds me of Messiaen." But he, Bob has his own birds, you know. <laughs> his birds are different from, from Messiaen's birds. And he was actually in Taiwan when he was thinking about writing this, and went to a, a tropical. I mean, it just dripped. It almost dripped with humidity, <laughs> with all the bird sounds and everything. It just was so full of imagery. Excuse me. Go ahead. Well, and his takeoff point was a, a, a uh, an excerpt from a Shelley poem, a, a Bird Thou Never Wert, and how the bird uh, improvises his song. So, in a sense, it's through compose. It's the longest one movement on the album. I think it's about 13 minutes long. I was thinking 10, but I think you're right. It is the longest at 13. Long, and the other pieces uh, are substantial, but more, you know, four movements or five movements or whatever. Uh, but by the time you're done with uh, the Birds of Paradise, you realize that it all fits together just marvelously well. Sometimes here in Houston, Texas, we will have a mockingbird give us a little recital, you know, as we're walking from our home to Rice University. And the mockingbird hasn't decided exactly what he or she is going to sing, but they give a little uh, a little concert. And this gives you that impression of uh, sort of improvisato improvisatory music that somehow, by the time you're finished with it, makes total sense. Yeah. And, and boy, that was put beautifully, because without, without structure, it's there for sure. Yes. Things become wandering mush, you know, I, I, in my view. I mean, it, you can, this piece is, as you said, through composed, but it, its structure is so sound. And the other thing that just freaks me out about it is the imagery. You are sucked into, uh, you know, as I mentioned, a dripping <laughs> a Thailand uh, uh, forest of calling birds and exotic animals and scampering things. I mean, the magic of music. Give me a break. Aside from aside from <laughs> emotions, imagery, for sure. Yeah. All right. Anthony Brandt is a colleague of yours. I uh, uh, reviewed a CD of his, uh, by his uh, group. I've just lost it here. You know who I mean. Um, Musica Houston. Musica yeah, Houston. right. Musica Houston, we I should say. We talk music often. Yes, uh, we do. It's a wonderful organization. They do contemporary music in such a way that people really yeah. enjoy it. It's not contemporary music to be feared. And they also have a great educational program with marvelous uh, programs, one of which I've performed a hundred times by now. Literally a hundred times. Over the last 10 years, yeah. <laughs> uh, and the, the piece that Tony wrote for us was commissioned not by us, but by the Round Top Music Festival uh, for us. When I saw, yeah, when I saw the top. Round Top, right. Texas, yeah. yes. And that's why I uh, got that, um, that particular title. And it's a, it's a, well, I, I was about to say monothematic piece in the sense that it really there's only one theme. It's not A, B, A. It's A, and then A varied, and A varied this way, and A varied that way. And as the piece goes on, it just, it, it's, he has found uh, dozens and dozens of ways to take this little snippet of a theme and make it, it's, the piece starts out uh, quite aggressively, and then it, it's a little quieter in the middle, although not much slower, just quieter, and then ends aggressively as well. Yeah, and I keep thinking, here's my, okay, here's my take. By the way, can I just ask you to come cuddle just a little bit more? You know, I'm paranoid about, I'm paranoid about losing you. Are we, 
<laughs> are we censored yet? Uh, thanks. I'm just, you know, I'm so nervous that I'm going to lose you on one side or the other. Uh, so I just want to make sure. Anyway, thank you. Um, okay, here's here's what I heard. Tell me I'm a crazy old man. I heard something kind of reminiscent in the begin in the opening of the Rite of Spring. There was something kind of primordial and uh, al almost, I thought, even a quote, yes. but not. And it's a very thickly scored piece. You know, big block chords in the piano. And for us to prepare it, the most difficult thing was for us to to find out which voice needed to be heard the most at any given time, because it could sound just like a mass of, of sound. And I think we I think we did it. I think we found a way to clarify Tony's intention. And as a result, it's uh, you know, Dan, I can't tell you which is my favorite piece on on this album because each one of the five is my favorite. But uh, we had a great time learning Tony's piece. I would say in the beginning, it was a little hard for us to understand what was going on until we were able to take it apart and uh, sort of clarify the voices. And we've played it a lot. We've actually played it a lot. We've played it in Mexico. We've played it several times in this area. And it's, it's a strong statement. And you know, at the beginning of our conversation, I'm not sure whether it was on tape, I mentioned that these pieces were... Uh, yeah, I overuse the word masterpieces. Of course they are, but they are also solid. They're just exactly. oh, they very much so. And, and certainly Anthony Brandt's piece is solid. It's a, it's a, it's a very seriously and intelligently worked out, created, structured, all of that. And you can, if you don't really hear it, you can feel it. This man is absolutely indeed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Richard Tenzing, Children of Light. I, 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 here's, here, I want to use a quote, okay? Quote from Richard Tenzing. I wish my music to bring, as best as I am able, the music of heaven down to earth. <laughs> I mean, stunning. And, and I think he really does that. It's yeah, just amazing. He, he definitely does in his writing. It, it's very interesting. After we played it at Rice, one of my former students, Ariella Perlman, actually the daughter of Itzhak Perlman, said, this reminds me very much of Messiaen's quartet for the end of time. There's a spirituality in the piece. And Dick was a very spiritual person. He it was a graduate of St. Olaf College, so grew up Lutheran, actually, but then got into... Um, Eastern Orthodox religion, and you can hear that in in some of his uh, movements. You you hear certain uh, uh, plain song from the the chants. And well, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, and the birds reappear. Well, <laughs> sun, sunset Earth. arrives. I mean, sun, yeah. sunrise arrives, and then the planet comes to life. I just absolutely sunrise. I write that brilliant compositional imaging of an event. Absolutely inspirational, a magical piece for program, and it is a ma this is a magical piece for for programming. I mean, this, it, this needs it, to be performed more. What Dick does with this piece is pretty extraordinary because first of all, he uses a lot of treble. There's clarinet in its highest register, mm -hmm. flute in its highest register, and piano in its highest register. Lots of sort of tinkly music that could be uh, a xylophone or a, a a high glockenspiel. High bell. It, it almost sounds percussive at times, but in the in the best sense. And he also juxtaposes very slow motion with sudden outbursts of uh, quick notes. And those quick notes are very very bird like. So it's like you go into church and you hear the the hymn, and then a bird gets caught in the rafters and is singing around while everyone is trying to sing a hymn. That's what I meant about the, the imagery of his writing. You can see. This, uh, uh, again, this sunrise at the, in dawn processional, it, it just happens. You know exactly what he's creating for you. Uh, Song of the Morning Stars, you know, stunning imagery once again. Go ahead, anybody want to talk to that one? Uh, ta and talk about narratives, and it's so brilliantly colorful and optimistic. I think of this man as being optimistic. His message is good. He was, he was a very positive person, a very gentle person, uh, a wonderful friend. I really enjoyed him from the very beginning of our friendship in Boston when I played his concerto for flutes and, and wind ensemble. And I played 
the concerto that he wrote for me in Boulder with the Boulder Philharmonic, and the conductor of that orchestra invited me to record it in uh, Kiev, the, the National Symphony of Ukraine. So uh, I'm very, very proud of, of having played those two works of, of Dick's. Now I'm going to have to go out and, and have, have a listen. I'm, you know, you're, you're driven me crazy. A, a flute concerto for flute and wind ensemble is perfect, you know, as wind ensemble conductor to wind ensemble conductor. Uh, <laughs> Well, I, do, I hope I didn't interrupt you. Uh, uh, silver lightning, golden rain. Is That's just, for flute alone, I believe. Yeah, and it's just a zap. Yes, that's what it is. Of the five movements, there's one movement that features the clarinet and one that features the flute, and that's the flute movement. Yep, and that was that was fun to work on to get it to be brilliant and and really convey the electricity of of perhaps a lightning. Lightning. Well, that, that was the imagery I got in, instantly. As I said, it was just like it, it's a, a 54 second, I think, written flash. Uh, yeah. Gold and and the idea of silver lightning flash and then golden rain. The sounds of the golden rain. Wonderful. wonderful. Okay, so let's it's, talk about Fos Hilarion. How you know, at this point, I don't remember the names of which movement is which. That's it's number been, five. Number five. The last. So, so we get we get back together. And it just with low sustained uh, uh, chords. Sets yeah, it ends bells. very quietly and with the, the piano doing some of its tinkling. And the up. hymn tune, beautiful hymn tune, yep. begins to put itself together. Yeah, lovely. Anything to say about that, that one? Well, I was just going to say, come to think of it, uh, in a way, each piece on the in the five gets more difficult than the previous one. The tensing was really? quite hard to put together. He, he really stretches us. To, to play high register, virtuosically loud, soft, etc. And then when we get to the Schoenfeld, it gets even more crazy in Why terms of. I should say that because I think it's. I think I, we ran across a couple of years ago. I mentioned I knew Paul Schoenfeld's music, and I think it was the quintet that's played so often. I think something like that. And of course, everybody said, "Oh, that's the hardest piece ever." And now you've just confirmed Paul Schoenfeld does not fool around. Tell me about how this sonatina of his. Which is wonderful how how that hard hard is because from the public's point of view in many ways it's sort of oh this is wonderful and charming and jazzy. Well, for one thing, uh, Paul is known to have written piano music that only he could play. <laughs> I mean, it's it's really too. Most pianists have to do some little something to make it slightly more <laughs> more playable. And Robert did a fabulous job with these he three really pieces. He really did. Uh, another piece of Schoenfeld's that I know well, because it contains clarinet, is a trio for violin, clarinet, and piano, which is That's all. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah, because yeah. David Peck, uh, David yes. Peck, and Edith Orloff from Houston. You remember oh, sure. David Peck and, and Edith you know, Orloff? They played moved out quite a few years ago. I think they're in San Diego now. They are. Uh, I, they've retired, I think, whatever, three, four years ago from Houston Symphony, oh. something like that. Yeah. Anyway, excuse me for interrupting. But yeah, that must be the one I'm thinking of, where they threw up their hands and said, oh, no. Not Paul Schoenfeld, he's so difficult. But it's worth it. It's yeah. it's extraordinary. And these three movements, ragtime and uh, what are the other ones? Oh, and something yeah. else. Uh, Charleston, <laughs> right. Oh, so he managed Charleston. to write a Charleston, which you you think would be you know kind of silly. But he makes it a virtuoso yeah, affair for all three instruments. Yeah, and he doesn't, uh, doesn't exactly, uh, how shall I put it, He's not exactly obvious. In other words, it's very it's a very subtle uh, re reveal, a very sophisticated yeah. reveal of the form of the trance yes. and dense form. Uh, I, and, and so I found that you know very challenging, rather dissonant chordal progressions, and uh, and then all of a sudden he kind of lightens up and off he goes on this jazzy rhythmical. Yeah, that's all, all true, but it's also a kind of music that everyone can relate to. Oh, absolutely. Because the the dance, fabulous. You know, oh, there's yeah. so much joy in that sonatina. I just enjoyed playing it, and it was really challenging in the best possible sense. And I'm, I see a note here. This is about the jig. This is this one is crazy fast ride. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Talk about virtuosity. 
Yeah. Well, I think we've we've actually just uh, gone gone through the CD. We talked. You get you've become even more uh, cuddly. The the colors and stuff could not be more perfect. Uh, you know, just put your feet up on a little hassock <laughs> over here, and, and hopefully with some of those street noises will not be too obnoxious. Uh, clarinetist Michael Webster, what a treat to uh, to meet you both. But uh, treat Michael Webster you. and Leo and Bicey, uh Well, first of all, what a couple. What a life. <laughs> Uh, it's been a pleasure to talk with you, Dan. And I'm, Thank I'm glad that we were able to, to uh, remember and speak about uh, Robert Murray, you know, your colleagues. So. Our hearts, and yes. we, we miss him. Yeah. Yes. Okay, well, I'm going to give one last little plug, and then we're going to hang up. Uh, Webster Trios, Crystal Records, 2015 release, American Webster. What a lovely title. Uh, featuring these works we've just discussed. It's a beautiful CD. And again, for, from a prof for, for professionals that are looking for repertoire, I... I have to say, get out there and have a look at this material. It's, it's, uh, lots of this material is, is familiar, I'm sure, to, to several people. But Robert Tenzing's piece, I don't know. that uh, Richard Tenzing's piece, that's a beauty. And Birds of Paradise, Robert Sirota's. Anyway, a great CD. Thank you for letting me, I hope, put out the word a little bit about it. We Thank you that. so much okay. for doing so. All right.